Thank you. We'd like to commence our talk this morning by sincerely thanking the Ngunnawal people, past and present, for having us on their country today. And we'd also really, really like to thank the many First Nations people that helped us on our journey to be able to tell this story to you today. We'd also like to thank CJ Bowerbird, who reminded us this morning to go barefoot more often. <laughs> we hope that you, like us, are here at TEDx Canberra today to learn, experience, and share with each other in possibly the oldest art form known to humanity, story. Since we perfected this art form, nearly 6,000 languages have disappeared from planet Earth. National Geographic estimates that by the year 2100, 90% of the nearly 7,000 languages spoken today will have become extinct. By letting so many languages slip away, we forfeit a lot more than words. We are losing countless stories, and with them go our identity and our instructions for living on the planet. I'd just like you to imagine for a moment that it's the year 2170. Now, if you haven't been accepted to be on the Mars One Challenge, your seventh generation descendant will be walking planet Earth. I'd like you to think about what their future may look like. Is it a green, peaceful, sustainable future where technology, innovation and design have enabled a world where humans and the planet live together in harmony? Or is it a future of strife, war and famine where knowledge and culture have basically been eliminated in the quest for survival? Now, if I, was waking, if I was considering cryogenics, I'd be hoping to wake up in the first scenario, the clean and green future. What would you say to your seventh generation descendant in 2170 if you could send them a message? What if you knew you had the knowledge they needed to make the difference between a green and peaceful future of sustainability or a future of war and famine? What would you do if you could not get that knowledge to them? These aren't hypothetical questions. This actually happened to me. So 14 years ago, I started my career with the National Parks and Wildlife Service. Part of my job was to work with Indigenous people. We'd be working on country, and they would always come up to me and say, what's your country? And I'd look at them and say, Australia? This happened all the time, until one year, this elder came up to me, and she looked me right in the eyes, and she said, what's your name, girly? <laughs> so I told her my name, and she said, no, your other name. And I told her my maiden name. With that, she sat back with a big smile on her face, and she said to me, I knew you were a black fella. Well, this was news to me. So <laughs> <laughs> I started a five-year quest to find my heritage. And 18 months ago, I discovered that I am part of the Gabrigal clan of Sydney. My ancestor was the last Aboriginal woman born on the banks of the Georges River. And she was bold and she was strong. She broke all the rules. She lobbied the New South Wales government, or the Aboriginal Protection Board at the time, for access rights. She was one of the first Aboriginal women to marry a white fella. And by 59, she was a successful farmer and had raised 13 children. But the most remarkable thing to me about Lucy Burns was that she did this despite 98% of her clan being wiped out by smallpox and violence. 40,000 years of our heritage has been lost, and my family line was lost for 108 years. Today, we're piecing our knowledge together through one A4 piece of paper, one old photograph, family anecdotes, 
and revisiting our uh, contemporary literature from 1850s with new eyes. I would give anything to hear our language spoken, our songs sung, and our stories told. I would give anything to be able to see the rites of passage, the rituals, and the art of my people. I would give anything to stare into the eyes of my ancestors. So, like I said, many of these things are lost for my family line, but not all is lost. Today, I'm drawing on my experience of losing my family story and the story of our clan to make sure that it doesn't have to happen to anyone again. But you don't have to be Aboriginal to understand the value of story. It matters to everyone. Think of your own families. I'm not Aboriginal, but I would like to share one of my stories with you today. Earlier this year, at a time of a lot of change and personal turmoil for me, Mick and I were travelling in Canada, planning our installation at the World Indigenous Network Conference. Our friend Kathy Manners had arranged for us to go onto a reservation and spend some time with Aboriginal people. The day before we were due to go onto the Rama Reservation, Kathy called us. She said an artist, an elder named Paul Schilling, had called her and absolutely insisted he meet with us. Mick and I were a bit puzzled. We were two public servants from Canberra. What do we know about art? But Paul was adamant we meet. The next day, we drove up to his house, isolated in a corner of the reservation. Snow was falling in the dawn light, it was minus 22 degrees, and Paul greeted us in a T-shirt. <laughs> he ushered us into his house and told us to sit by the fire and warm up, and with few words, he made us coffee. Mick and I looked at each other, silently communicating that this was going to be a long couple of hours. Paul brought us the coffee, we sipped it politely and made awkward small talk. Then, he asked us if he could do a smudge ceremony, and we agreed. He prepared the hot coals, mixing them with sage, sweetgrass and cedar. We took the pungent smoke and cleansed our faces, our heads and our hearts, as visitors to Paul's country had done for countless generations. When we were finished, Paul took the smoke and solemnly cleansed himself. Immediately, something changed. He turned to us and spoke, animated, almost without drawing breath, for the entire two hours we were there. He told us his story of suffering and pain, of loss, turmoil and wandering, of how ultimately he found hope and peace by reconciling the pieces of himself into a whole, beautiful, creative person. Paul told us the stories of his people, and I am able to share one with you today. The prophecy of the seven fires. 30,000 years ago, the Ojibwe of North America prophesied that red, white, yellow, and black men would one day meet. At first, times would be dark, but, in the hour of their greatest need, they would find strength in diversity and together build a kinder world. As we were leaving, Paul grabbed me by my shoulders. He looked me straight in my eyes, a stare with seven generations of urgency, and he said to me, this is the time of the prophecy. Our people have been waiting. We are ready to tell our story. You must make a way for this to happen. You must make a place for story. I looked back at him, shaking solemnly. I had no idea how I would do this. I had no idea what the details would be, and I had no idea how much energy this would later cost us. But I knew I was now the custodian of the stories of Paul and his people, and I knew the gravity of what that meant. Keeping our commitment to Paul Schilling and the Gabrigal clan, we convened a team of seven people from three continents at the World Indigenous Network Conference in May. 
In three days, our team collected more than 100 stories. Our Canadian friends Eric Young and Jess Housty told the compelling and moving story of Cecil of the Kitlope and his magic canoe. Cynthia Franco and Tom Smith recorded more than 30 interviews on video. All of these are powerful stories. Some are contemporary, like the account from the Egyptian woman Yusira, who told us of the toppling of President Morsi more than a month before it happened. Some are ancient wisdoms, lessons for life and living. Kathy Manners, Mick and I coordinated an art space where more than 100 artists painted 55 canoe paddles, including the two that are on stage with us today. At the end of the conference, the paddles were gifted to selected delegates. They have gone all across the globe to every continent on Earth, including Antarctica. They serve as talking sticks, connecting people across space to share story. And we are currently collecting some of these stories in an online gallery. And what was the red thread? What was the common theme that was drawing these people from across the globe to Australia at this time? What brought 1,300 people from 55 nations to Darwin in 2013? First Nations people are proud custodians of humanity's spoken history. But there is a growing anxiety, no matter their age, that they are the last ones. And there is an urgent need to share their stories with people who are awake. Remember a few moments ago how you felt about your seventh generation descendant in the 2170 scenario that Mick talked about? First Nations people are feeling that deeply and they are feeling it now. The good news is that what happened to my clan and what these people are concerned about that told us about in Darwin is that it never has to happen to anyone again. We've seen incredible potential to combine the world's most ancient wisdoms with the world's newest technologies. And today, we've been able to work with some incredible people to prepare an example of how technology can help people relate to ancient wisdoms through art and through augmented reality. And right now, we're just going to show you a quick video we prepared earlier on how you can interact with the artwork from Dee Greer, Yin and Mankali, and Roy Bernelia today. Augmented reality, or AR, is a new way to tell old stories. It links experiences discrete in time and place together to tell a new, stronger story. AR can be many things. It can be, for example, listening to the voices of those who fought for justice and equality in our country here in Reconciliation Place in Canberra. Or you can relate to pieces of art like this with digital technologies. We've collaborated with Amber Stanley, the AR studio, and the artists to augment the paddles we're holding today. You can hear the stories of the art from the artists themselves, either in the foyer at the break or online later. All you need is a mobile device. Download the AR studio app, it's free. Then open the app on your device. Hold it over the paddle or a picture of the paddle on paper or screen. The app will recognise the augment and load the story. It might take a minute, but it's worth waiting for, I guarantee. Hi, my name's Dee Green and Minkali. The painting I did on the oar, firstly, is my signature piece. So in the break, or at home, why don't you try it for yourself? Download the AR Studio app from iTunes. It's free and it's fun. Every single one of us in the theatre today is creating a lifelong digital epitaph, and most certainly your future descendants will be doing the same thing, potentially through Facebook if it still exists, or AR. What you're going to say to your seventh generation descendant in 2170 is being created today and tomorrow and for the rest of your life. You're actually telling them what you would tell them today now. So I urge you to make it count.
To help you make the message to your seventh generation descendant count, we want to give you a gift. This was given to us in Canada by a Minjikning elder named Christine Douglas, and today we're going to share it with you. First, I want you to shake the hand of the person next to you. <laughs> the handshake is an ancient symbol of balance, trust, and equality, and it's an invitation to the other person to share your stories. For the most part, we've forgotten the meaning of this simple gesture we do every day. So in a moment, I want you to shake the hand of the person on the other side of you. But this time, really shake their hand. Feel the texture of their skin, its warmth, the strength of their grip. Look them in the eye while thinking to yourself, I trust you and I am equal to you. So shake their hand. Come and shake my hand. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Well done, guys. You have just made the first step in connecting deeply and meaningfully and sharing stories with people you've just met. But if you'd like to take that a little bit further, the second step is to combine that meaningful handshake that you just did with these four questions. What are you most proud of? And this is the thing that you are most proud of. What concerns you most? What is your most pressing need? And what can you do to help? The very real challenges facing humanity today can only be overcome through collaboration, and that's collaboration across gender, across age, and across time. Countless intelligent people have walked this earth before us and have asked the very same questions that we ask today. Only we're lucky because they've left us clues to their answers in stories old and new. Story links then, now, next. Know your story, share your stories, so together we can all create new stories. Your descendants depend on them.